Today we're learning about the social order in period three with a special focus on what was going on in Europe and the Middle East. After the fall of the Western Roman Empire, Western and Central Europe was split into a multitude of small states and kingdoms. Some, like those in Central Europe, weren't well organized but were home to a variety of Germanic ethnic groups. Others, like those in Western Europe, had established states. There were the Visigoths in Spain, the Franks in France, and the Britons, separated into several kingdoms, in England. These people were mostly agriculturalists, although, as threats arose, they each dealt with them as best they could. For the most part, though, what happened between 500 and about 700 CE in Europe was the continued spread of Christianity, moving now not just along the Mediterranean Sea coast, but further into Europe, and crossing the English Channel to Scotland and England. Beginning in the late 700s, or the 8th century, and continuing through the 1000s, these varied states and kingdoms of Western Europe would be faced with incursions from a northern people who have come to be known as the Vikings. Here's a fun fact. In Old Norse, the word Viking is a feminine noun referring to a journey. The masculine noun, vikinger, so just the word viking with an R at the end, refers to a soldier or sailor who takes part in an overseas voyage. So at least that adoption of the word in English makes sense. In Old English, though, the word viking, which was spelled V-I-C-I-N-G, was used to describe the northern raiders who began attacking the English coast around the 700s. It was only in the 19th century, so really recently, that the word Viking took on its modern definition of this great barbarian warrior from the north. So even our vocabulary words change and evolve through time, and that's something to keep in mind when we think about contextualizing history. But back to the story. We know now that these Vikings belong to a northern European culture. They were minor agriculturalists because their climate didn't really allow for a reliance on agriculture. They were incredibly successful traders. In fact, while the Western Europeans came to fear the Vikings as these invaders, to the Eastern Europeans, the Vikings were called the Rus, and they were one of the Byzantine Empire's many trading partners. The Vikings traded in the goods available in Scandinavia, so furs, timber, fish. They were also facilitators of the active slave trade within Europe, which you can see, in part, from the map there on the slide. Still, the various Scandinavian peoples who were collectively known as the Vikings, they did share one element in their culture, that as an ethnic group, they tended to embrace the more violent aspects of life. They enjoyed fighting, in other words. And during the early Middle Ages, their shipbuilding technology was vastly superior to that of any other European culture, and they used this technology to gather treasure and to expand their territories. In fact, they would be the first Europeans to establish a colony in the New World, which they do around 1000 CE in Newfoundland, so modern-day Canada. Now, in the 8th century, when the Vikings first began to attack Western Europe, their goal seemed to be based on gathering treasure. They knew that a lot of nobles had treasure and that the Christian churches throughout Europe tended to be places where the nobles kept their treasures, and so these were the areas that they tended to focus on in their raids. Because they traveled by ship, they tended to hit mostly coastal areas in France and in the British Isles. So these are the first places that document the invasions by the Vikings. By the time we get to the 9th century, though, the goals change, really, for the Vikings, and they began to expand territorially as opposed to just raiding for treasure. Now, part of this expansion was probably the response to a series of civil wars amongst the different Viking kingdoms. The Vikings would settle in Ireland and in Scotland, they would solidify their hold in certain areas of northern England, and they would continue to raid France for territory and for treasure. At the beginning of the 10th century, as a way to stop the Viking raids, the King of France offered one of those Viking leaders, a man by the name of Rollo, full control over a territory of western France. So some of the Vikings settled in what became Normandy in about 911, and Rollo becomes the first Duke of Normandy. Now that's a really important point because just over a hundred years later, Rollo's descendants are going to invade England and establish a kingdom there. So really the kingdom that they established in England, which we call the Norman Kingdom, was a Viking kingdom. <laughs>
The Viking incursions into Western Europe had prompted the centralization of various states. The fact that the Umayyad dynasty was also pushing into Europe through Spain further underscored this need for organization. Now, within the relatively small states, European monarchs were both politically and religiously influential, in part because of the tradition of divine kingship. This was a belief that God had chosen that person or that person's family to rule over that territory. And this idea is a holdover from the Old Testament concept of what it meant to be a king. Well, monarchs often took advantage of this religious connection by asking religious leaders, sometimes popes, to anoint them as king of their territory. In this way, they alluded directly to the stories of the prophets anointing the early kings of Israel. By the turn of the 9th century, so around the time that the Vikings are expanding for land as opposed to treasure, kings who had dealt more or less successfully with the Vikings became powerful enough to establish empires in Europe. The best example of this is Charles the Great, who goes down in history as Charlemagne of Francia, king of France. He was the first European medieval king to expand his territory into an empire. Building on the consolidation of territory that his father had initiated, Charlemagne kept expanding Francia's borders into modern-day Germany and modern-day Italy. Charlemagne was crowned emperor on Christmas Day of the year 800. This empire that he created, which was known as the Carolingian Empire, was the largest seen in Europe since the time of the Roman Empire, and it challenged the Byzantine Empire of Eastern Europe for supremacy over Europe. Unfortunately, when Charlemagne's son and successor died, the Carolingian Empire was split into three parts, one part for each of Charlemagne's grandsons, and so the great Carolingian Empire didn't actually last for very long. So the Carolingian Empire ebbs and flows pretty much within the 9th century. But in the 10th century, the other great medieval European state is born. And this is the Holy Roman Empire. It was born from the German remains of the Carolingian Empire, established in 962, and it would last for nearly a thousand years until 1806. The founder of the Holy Roman Empire was a king by the name of Otto the Great, or Otto I, he was only tangentially related to Charlemagne's family. His great, 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 great aunt was married to one of Charlemagne's grandsons. But the real importance of the Holy Roman Empire lies in its organization. Because you see, this wasn't a traditional empire or kingdom at all. It was a confederation of states, and it was made up of the hereditary territories that belonged to the emperor, and of which he was directly the king or the duke or the count, and also states belonging to other rulers who agreed, or were forced, to belong to this confederation. The emperors of the Holy Roman Empire were elected by the most powerful leaders of the German states. That said, of course, the election was mostly routine, and the throne usually passed down through the same family, essentially creating a dynasty. The emperors had some influence and authority in the various states, but for the most part, each state was ruled autonomously by its ruler, and they only came together in periods of high stress, when the empire was being attacked, for example, as it was pretty routinely throughout the medieval era. Partly as a result of the organization necessitated by fighting off the Vikings, and partly as a result of increasing political centralization in Europe, a distinct social system emerged in Europe by the 11th century. We call this system feudalism. Now, the feudal system describes a relationship between a lord and his followers, or his vassals. The lord was a wealthy, influential person, kind of like the patron in the Roman patron-client relationship, who was able to promise protection to his followers, and who rewarded his followers for their service with gifts of land, which were called fiefs. The vassal, on the other hand, was most often a soldier, someone who'd served his lord in a military sense. In Europe, these highly trained soldiers fought on horseback, and so they were known as cavalry. These vassals were also known as knights. In exchange for his service, the vassal owed his lord homage, which was the promise of respect, and fealty, which was the promise of loyalty. So medieval European kings were seen as lords who'd managed to acquire lots of land that they could gift their vassals. This made them powerful. However, Medieval kings required service from their vassals, usually military service. So in this way, these kings would remain dependent on their vassals. 
In other words, this is what made them weak. A feudalism was the way that this population could operate. And if we look at the organization here of the particular social classes, we have the king at the top, which makes sense. He is the lord above all lords. The nobles, who would be the king's direct vassals, the very powerful lords. The knights, who served their nobles and, by extension, their king. And then the vast majority of the rest of the population, who were peasants or serfs. Technically speaking, though, peasants and serfs were not a part of the feudal system, but a part of a different system altogether. The system which describes the relationship between the nobles and the lower class is called manorialism. The development of this system was probably also the result of Viking invasions and political centralizations. A lord's territory was known as a manor. The people who worked on his manor were either peasants, who were legally free agricultural workers, or serfs, who were legally unfree agricultural workers. And while peasants were able to move around the countryside and seek employment from various lords, serfs were legally tied to the land of the manor. They could not move away. They could not farm on their own. They couldn't even marry without their lord's permission. Probably what had happened was that during the era of continual Viking raids, peasants had probably been fairly prosperous farmers who couldn't defend themselves against the Vikings but could pay other soldiers to do it. And so this payment allowed them to remain free. Serfs, however, may have been poorer farmers who couldn't afford to pay soldiers. And so they developed a barter system by which they fed the soldiers who then protected them. Over time, these serfs became tied to the land and they were legally considered part of the manor which their protectors owned. So this was the development of the manorial system. For most of Europe, at this time, the manor was the center of economic activity. Europe was overwhelmingly rural and agricultural during this period. As we might imagine, it was also patriarchal. And one of the great agricultural innovations of this time was the use of the three-field system, by which manors farmed two fields while leaving one field fallow to allow that fallow field to recover. This system replaced the older two-field system which allowed for an increase in agricultural productivity. Anytime you have an increase in food production, you get an increase in people. And so Europe's population increased throughout most of the Middle Ages. Now, while most of Europe was agricultural, there were parts of Europe, mostly along the coasts, that retained a more urban setting and purpose. These were the areas of Europe that served as commercial hubs for the whole of the continent. In northern Italy, various city-states were granted autonomy through charters, by which they, and other cities across Europe, were able to govern themselves. These charters were documents which said that while the land on which the city stood belonged to some noble, the city's inhabitants could pay a tax to ensure that they received their autonomy and could make their own laws. These city-states, such as Florence and Venice in northern Italy, became known for their trade in luxury goods, most of which came from the Islamic world and via sea routes across the Mediterranean. In northern Europe, some Germanic and we would also say Dutch cities also gained their autonomy through charters. These cities used their locations along the coast of the English Channel or the North Sea or the Baltic Sea or even just major riverbanks to enrich their inhabitants. These cities formed a trading association in the 1200s that was known as the Hanseatic League, which initially focused its trade and energies towards Eastern and Northern Europe. This league would be in existence until the 1600s, so well into the 17th century, and because of that would also be active in the age of exploration and colonial trade in a later period in European history. Now, Despite the significant social changes between 500 and 1000 CE, Europe remained highly patriarchal during this time. While the Christian Bible stresses the equality of all believers before God, the men in charge of both secular or non-religious institutions and religious institutions saw women as inferior to men, and so women in general had fewer rights than men across Europe. If we look a little more closely at the Islamic world, we find that, unlike Europe, whose social system changed in significant ways from what had existed previously, 
the greatest social change occurring in Muslim areas was based primarily on religion, with ethnicity and a little bit of gender issues addressed as well. From that religious standpoint, the Quran, like the Christian Bible, emphasizes the equality of all Muslims. But again, this is a spiritual equality, not necessarily a secular equality. And so, as was traditional to the region and was becoming very traditional to Muslim society, the society in their area was strictly patriarchal. While Muslim women often had rights denied to European women, for example, they could own businesses, they could divorce an abusive husband, in most Muslim states, women were less important than men. In addition, Muslim society remained hierarchical and, as had been the case since Sumerian times, millennia before, it was divided by occupation. Families who worked in service to the caliph were at the highest levels of society, while slaves were at the lowest level. From a religious standpoint, the Muslim caliphates had to deal with a much more heterogeneous population than did the leaders of Europe. As a result, a new social hierarchy, this one based on religion, emerged. Those subjects of the caliphates who practiced Judaism or Christianity and who shared a spiritual heritage with Muslims were called people of the book, or dimi. As so much of the Mediterranean basin was either Jewish or Christian in the early years of Muslim expansion, most non-Muslims living in the Umayyad Caliphate qualified as dimis. Now, viewed legally as second-class citizens, the dimi had to pay a tax in order to continue practicing their faith. But despite this categorization as second class, some dimi did serve the caliph at the very highest levels of government, and thus they achieved high social status and influence within the caliphate. Non-Muslim people who were not Jewish or Christian were called kafir, and tended to be treated much more harshly than dimi. The kafir populations included the remaining animists of the Middle East and Northern Africa, Zoroastrians in Persia, and, after the Abbasid Caliphate began sending conquerors to South Asia, Hindus and Buddhists in that area. The various Muslim caliphates required higher taxes from kafir and made more regular efforts to convert kafir to Islam. So what we see is in that areas where kafir populated a majority, the conquest by the Muslims tended to be a bit more harsh than in areas where Dimi lived. Just as, generally speaking, the social hierarchy doesn't change much in the Islamic world, neither does the government order. You still have a caliph at the very top of the caliphate. Spiritual leaders are still called imams. However, you do have a split of the caliphate that begins to occur in the 10th century. So as you've read, until the late 900s, the Muslim world was united as one caliphate that was ruled by various dynasties, right? We have the Umayyad dynasty first, followed by the Abbasid dynasty a little later on. But beginning in the 900s, there were multiple caliphates spread throughout the Islamic world. They're united by their shared religious belief, but these caliphates are ruled by various ethnic groups. You have Arabs and Persians in the Middle East, and increasingly, you have Turks in the Near East. And while the various Turkish groups would, for the most part, adopt wholesale the organization of the original Muslim caliphates, they did introduce a new term for their leaders, the Sultan. As Turkish groups overtook caliphates run by Arabs or Persians, they adopted this new terminology, and so these new Turkish Muslim states were known as Sultanates. So a Sultan is just like a caliph, a Sultanate is just like a caliphate, it's just a change in vocabulary. The various Muslim caliphates had developed a bureaucratic system of government, which they probably wholesale just inherited from the Persians and later from the Byzantines. So trained individuals occupied positions within the government. In order to maintain both bureaucracy and empire, the Muslim states required the collection of various taxes. Some of these taxes were land-based, based on land wealth, how much land you owned. Others were religious-based, for the Dimi and the Kafir, for example. Viziers were the highest ranking political officials. A version of this term was applied in the Abbasid Caliphate, uh, adopted from an earlier period, and in some Muslim countries, the term vizier is still used to this day to denote a political official. One of the more popular practices of the Muslim bureaucracy was a practice that was known as tax farming. <laughs> 
Tax farming is when a government sells tax collecting contracts to an individual or a group of individuals, a corporation. The government would determine the amount of tax revenue that had to be collected on each contract, and the tax farmers then agreed to collect and hand over that amount. However, the government allowed tax farmers to decide what methods of collection they would use and how much actual money they would collect. So long as the government got the required tax, they didn't actually care how much money tax farmers charged. So tax farmers could keep a profit from any monies collected over the tax contract amount. This allowed the Muslim states to get rich fairly quickly, but it also began to oppress, in an economic sense, the people at the lowest levels of society. Now, eventually, that is going to boil over, but we'll get to that in a later period as well. Now, unlike European monarchs who depended on their vassals for military strength, Muslim caliphs and, and sultans sustained their own standing armies made up of professional soldiers. These armies were sometimes quite large in size. This made the Muslim states formidable enemies and ultimately allowed Muslim states to increase their territory expansively across the Middle East, across North Africa, into South Asia, and even into Eastern and Western Europe. Now, before we get too comfortable with this social order, let me foreshadow a little bit. In the middle of the 1300s, in the middle of the 14th century, a new disease emerged in Eurasia. Coming originally from East Asia, it traveled along trade routes, both by land and by sea, to the Islamic world and then to Europe. This disease, which is known in history as the bubonic plague or the Black Death, would have a significant impact on social and even political organization across Eurasia. But we'll talk about that more a little next semester. <laughs>